Hi guys, happy Thursday, June 11th. I'm Danny Gregory and this is Draw With Me. I uh, apologize for my tardiness, but uh, Ian and I have been just setting some stuff up and now hopefully we are all in sync. Okay, um, today we are going to be drawing monochromatically. Namely, we're gonna be using uh, just shades of black, white, gray, and everything in between, no colors. At least that's what I'm gonna be doing, that's what Ian's gonna be doing. Um, if you'd like to draw with, along with us, we're gonna be using a photograph, which you can download by typing in this URL down here. So you can see the URL here, bit.ly bit dot bit slash DWM611. So that's draw with me June 11th, which is today. So if you wanna go and draw th that picture, you can. Um, and, but you don't really need to, you can draw from whatever you'd like. The main thing is we just want to play around with ignoring color, ignoring color. It just seems like, uh, I don't know, we're in that kind of a mood. And also, uh, it's because my guest today is Ian Fennelly, who's, uh, an instructor at sketchbook school, among other things. He's also a great artist and a great, um, a great teacher. So. He is, um, has been teaching workshops for a long time, and he's going to be teaching a workshop for us, which is called Paint the Town Gray. And that is coming up in a couple of weeks. If you haven't signed up for it, um, please do. You can do it right here at Skip. I'm oh, sorry, not there. Actually, you can sign up here at uh, sketchbookschool.com slash workshops. So um, we will come back to that address later on in case you say, boy, I love that, Ian. I've got to get more of it. So uh, you will be able to. Um, what else? It's been a while since I've seen you, a couple of weeks, a couple of uh, tumultuous weeks here in the United States of America and uh, the endless dragging on of the pandemic everywhere in the world, including where you are, no doubt. So we, uh, we carry on. We carry on with drawing at home. Although now, for the first time, we can start in some places to go outside and draw a little bit. Uh, there seems to be a, a mad dash for people to go in and um, unlock themselves from their from their uh, quarantine. I haven't really done that. I've been more or less the same as as I have been for the last three months here in this house in Phoenix, Arizona. But um, I hope that you're doing well. It's nice to see all of you. Cristiano in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, who else? Critix in Bonn, Germany. And uh, various other people. Stephanie and Catherine and Patricia and Devin and Sarah and Maggie. So, all right. Well, Ian is going to join us in a minute. And we're going to start doing some drawing. Um, I hope that you have signed up for this workshop. If not, please do so. It's going to be fantastic. And uh, let me go and grab Ian and see if he is ready to to join. Okay, hold on a second. <laughs> there he is. Hi, Ian. Hi, Danny. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you. So, Ian, um, first, first of all, where are you? Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm at home, um, like probably most of the world. I'm, in, I'm indoors. <laughs> Good which thing. is which is in Hoylake, which is about half an hour outside outside Liverpool. Um, so I'm just I'm just in the back room at the moment. Um, obviously, we can't get out a huge amount. We can get out once or twice, um, go to the shops, obviously go and see people, go and see our kind of immediate family bubble. But um, yeah, the rest of the time we're pretty much still in kind of lockdown because things haven't been great for the UK. You know, by comparison, we were very slow in. In kind of shutting everything down so i think we're kind of reaping some of the rewards of that at the moment so so yeah things 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 are not great i mean for me personally everything's fine because I'm, I'm able to work from home and i'm able to do lots and lots of stuff but i just i know there's a lot of people out there who are 
but probably just getting a bit fed up with the whole thing now. And, you know, some people are probably really struggling. So doing things like this is just is just great because you're still able to, you know, connect with people and, and meet people and talk to people. So Absolutely. it's brilliant. Yeah. It's no, it's, it's, yeah. it's, re- it's really fun to, to get together virtually um, and to just take some time, you know, on a regular basis to sit and draw, you know, to remind ourselves that this is an option. Um, we don't just have to watch Netflix and uh, eat frozen food. We can also draw. It's so. So, it's so good for you as well, Danny, isn't it? Because it just fixes you in the moment. You know, you, you, you're just kind of focusing on the, the thing that's in front of you, whether it's from a, a screen or whether it's from an observation. And, you, you know, your mind is just focused on creating that image and working with tone and shape. And you forget about everything else. And, you know, I just find it so distressing because there's so many big things going on out there that we can't control, but we can control what we put down on a piece of paper. So in that sense, it's just brilliant. It's just, you know, it's a great, great thing to do. Yeah, it's a great perspective. I agree with with everything you're saying. Now, I want to ask you specifically because drawing outside is your thing. You're you you are a, a an urban mm-hmm. landscape artist, an urban sketcher. And um, how has that been? How, how have you adapted to the fact that you can't go and draw in all these beautiful yeah. places? It's been, I mean, it's been about three three months now. I guess it was probably the middle of March when we found out in the UK that, you know, we, we, we couldn't go out as much as, as we liked. So everything kind of just closed down. So I did a kind of urban sketching tour of my house and I did a whole series of pictures of my house, the living room, the kitchen, the dining room, the, the hallway, all that kind of thing. And that was great because that was just like me touring around the house. Um, and then the next thing I kind of moved on to was I started um, doing lots of vehicles, lots of kind of big, big machinery. So I did lots of um, bulldozers and tractors and, and boats and things like that. So I kind of did a whole series of those, which was great fun. But probably for about the last four weeks, um, we've been able to get outside a bit more. So I've been going out drawing with, with some friends and just keeping a bit of a distance. And I've been going out and drawing a lot by myself as well. So I'm able to get out and do a lot more work. but all the trips, all the workshops, all the amazing places and fabulous people I was meant to be meeting on location, they've all just kind of gone by the by. And each each month, another trip goes past. So today I was meant to be flying out to Oslo. Um, and the next week I'm meant to be going off to Ireland. And last, last week or two weeks ago, I was meant to be in Romania. So you can just kind of see it as you, as you I, I don't look at my diary anymore because it's like so depressing. I just want to kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> I know we were we were supposed to be in Greece right now with uh, Kosha and my friend Prashant, and we were supposed to be drawing for two weeks in Greece, and uh, you know so we're here instead. Um, what I want to ask you also was: so you've been drawing from photos? Is that a normal thing for you to do? No, it's not. No, and it's it's a totally different experience as well. Um, I mean, I spend a lot of time talking about the difference between drawing from photographs and drawing from life. And with a a photograph, everything is there in front of you. You know, time has just stood still and every because I'm looking at the image on the screen now of the flat iron building that we're going to be sketching together in a moment. And every aspect of that image is screaming back at you. Draw me, draw me, draw me, draw me. So everything has the same value. But if you were to look at it in real life and you exist in the same space as that as that image, you know, you would see a lot more. You would see the space that you're actually in and you'd select things and you'd edit things with so much more confidence and power, which you don't do with a photograph. So you look at the photograph and, and the flat iron building, which is the focal point, which is the thing that you would connect with on location, has got as much value as, you know, the crack in the pavement at the bottom because it's all flat, because it's all two-dimensional so photographs I, I find really challenging because there's no space there's no depth in them and you're basically just copying another piece of art but having said that I'm actually quite good at working from a photograph and almost pretending I'm there um I, I can I can almost I suppose parody the fact that I would be there on location so when I do this sketch now I will just try it my hardest to imagine I'm actually in New York and try and focus on the things that I would imagine I would focus on if I was really there. But it's hard, and it, I think that just comes from practice and having done it so many times, you know, because over the years I've had to do so many commissions where I've had to work from a photograph that I can almost simulate the effect of, of being there. But it's it's tricky, it's, 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 not, it's not the same. 
and it's it's right. hard to teach as well. I you think know, it's, yeah. it's difficult. To teach. I think it's not a concept that people who are just starting out to draw really understand the difference between when you're drawing. We say you're drawing from a photograph. You're not actually. You're drawing a photograph. So you're not drawing the street scene. You're drawing a photo of the street scene, and that's really different because. First of all, yeah. you are not making decisions yourself about what you're going to see. The photographer mm -hmm. has made those decisions for you. Secondly, yeah. you're not seeing in three dimensions, you're seeing in two dimensions. So therefore you are, the scene is compressed and things are artificially designed by the lens of the camera. These are all things mm -hmm. that initially may not seem problematic when you are learning mm -hmm. to draw, but over time, as you draw more and more, it's it becomes it becomes more of a chore i find when i'm working on a photograph i feel like i'm sort of scanning through the photograph copying it yeah, but i'm not absolutely. i'm not making the choices that i would make because again if you think about that scene that we were just looking at um it is it is uh really um it seems like a fairly large image a large part of the scene but if you think about your entire peripheral vision you know, if you were sitting there on the corner of 23rd Street and Fifth Avenue, looking downtown, uh, that's actually probably looking up. Yes, you'd be you you would see so much more. You would see so much more. So you have to kind of hone in on that. And um, mm -hmm. you know, if you've ever tried to take a photograph of the moon, you'll know how your brain like makes it seem like, wow, look at that giant moon. You turn to take a uh, photograph and you realize it's a little tiny, tiny dot. It's right? Tiny. Yeah. So I mean, a big. A a big thing that I do, Danny, is is, is I, I tell stories on location and I, I tell the story of me, the stories of what I see and what I experience. And for me to tell the stories, if I was to tell the story of me being looking at the Flatiron building in New York now, I'd need to see what what is much further over to the left and much further over to the right so I can bring them in so they can become part of the narrative. So they become part of the storytelling element of me saying what it is i'm really interested in and and the photograph is cropping all that off the photograph is is taking all that away from me so all i can do is tell the story of me looking at this photograph which which is not the quite quite the same thing so for example i would i would you know i I'd, I'd be scanning the scene looking what's over the on the right and what's over on the left and there might be a fire hydrant or there might be a another sign and i can kind of bring them in and tweak them in a way which enables me to really edit the scene. So it's 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 expressing what I want to say about that place. But but this is just a very limited amount of, of information. Um, but having said that, you know, given the fact that I can't go to New York at the moment, it's the next best thing. And, and, and you know, you can still have loads of fun. You can still really experiment with your, exactly. your materials, your tones. Exactly. So, so yeah. And, then, and that's, so we're, so right. today's focus is not on drawing from photographs, but today's focus is on monochromia drawing from uh, drawing in black and white. And that is that is the, the focus of your workshop as well, which is about urban yeah. sketching and tones. So today, I don't imagine, draw with me, just so you know, Ian, draw with me is not a drawing lesson. Our purpose is not to teach. Our purpose is just to draw together. So um, mm -hmm. you're gonna draw, I'm gonna draw, everybody in the audience is hopefully gonna draw too, and we're just gonna chat and hang out while we do it. Um, so let's plan on doing that. I have a camera, uh, which I'm going to put on here, which is going to show my page. Um, and uh, let me see if I can also bring in, in, in some small way. Oops. Okay, this is going to take a little bit of jiggling because I'm going to try and... Um, here, here's what I'll do. I will, I will disappear. And Ian, you will be in a little bubble. Um, and, uh, and then this will be this. This will be Ian. So Ian, you're you're in the corner, and we can okay. we can see you. Um, would you Would you like me to keep holding my picture up? At the moment, it's blank. Okay, that's all, that's all I've done. All right. Well, same here. <laughs> same here. Same um, here. So everybody, if you want, I'm going to take away this thing, but it's bit.ly slash dwm611. That is the URL to download this picture. It's also in the notes below this video so you can get it there, but I'm going to get rid of it because <clears throat> we have enough going on on the scene, on the screen here already. Um, and I'm going to focus my thing. So uh, Ian, you are, we can see you, we can't see me. 
Wait, we actually could see me there. Then now we can see both of us. Okay, um, and we're going to just start drawing. I'm not. You're. What what materials are you going to be using today? Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to start off with the same four brush pens that I did on my workshop. Okay, okay. so my paint the town grey when I did the picture of Albella Bello. Try saying that three times after a pint. Um, I'm going to use the same four brush pens to start off with, and then I'm going to use the fine liners. So basically the same materials as I did okay, last so, time. So this is what you're so going to be I'm, using in the workshop that hasn't happened yet. So when we do the yeah. workshop, you're going to be using these materials. And same. Um, yeah. So brush markers, and I am using um, I'm using ink, and I'm using a water brush, and uh, I'm just using diluted ink in part because I don't have brush markers because um, I am living in a parallel universe in Phoenix, Arizona, instead of in my studio in New York. So I don't have many of the tools that I would like to have, but um, you know, we make do. We are creative people. Uh, Danny, Danny, would yes. you you like me to keep holding mine up every now and then without yeah, help. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you just talk talk while you're drawing, and uh, okay. and just tell some stories, and every so often pause to show us where you're at. Okay. And what is your and think and tell us a bit about what you're thinking about as you're working on this. You know. Okay. So at the moment, then I'm just filling the big shapes. I'm just thinking really, really big shapes. I'm not thinking detail. I'm just kind of structuring everything on the page. Yeah, and um, I, yeah, and so everybody can see what I'm doing. Unfortunately, we don't have a okay. camera on. Ian, Ian's holding it up. Um, let me just make it a bit bigger. Let me disappear. You don't need me. Uh, okay, Ian. Yes. Okay, so you're doing a pencil sketch, basically, of your. Yeah. So that's what I'd probably do if I was starting off, just trying to fill the page with really, really big shapes. Yeah, I, I'm working in a totally different way because I don't like doing pencil sketches. So I am uh, I'm basically just doing a light ink drawing of the basic shapes that um, those of you who took Own Mars workshop, it influenced me quite a lot. And uh, I am sort of working in using her style, which is basically to do a loose watercolor Kind of layer first and then um to, to go in with pens afterwards so so i kind of like trying to get the thing to be more and more sort of in focus by adding details as we go um, and i'm not obsessing too much about whether or not i have the proportions and so forth right it's less important to me than just getting the kind of overall mood. In part because of Ian's workshop, but I think also in part because of my mood in general, I have been doing a lot of stuff in just black and white. In fact, this my uh, sketchbook is entirely black and white. I haven't used any color at all since I started doing it. Um, I don't know why. I don't know. I've gone through hey. periods like this before. Do you, do you have that too? Yeah, let's see where you're at now. Okay, so. So that's yeah. just with the brush pen. That's with just the medium gray brush pen, just to kind of break all the big spaces up and get some kind of sense of perspective to take me in. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna go in with a lighter one. I'm gonna start working on some of the tone work. So I'll go, that's a medium one. So I'll go in with a lighter one and then I'll go in with a darker one. So I've got like three tonal values. Go in with medium, then go light, then go dark. That's the plan. That's that the plan. is the plan. You never know, right? I basically make most of it up as I go along anyway. Yeah. Um, what do you think about when we're working from a color photograph? Like how are you how are you deciding what your tonal ranges are gonna be? I guess if it's a colored one, I just kind of look beyond a coloured one and just see it in terms of tone anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, most, most of my most of my work, obviously, I'm, I'm always using colour, but a lot of the time I'm kind of seeing things in terms of, of tone because it's the tone that makes it obviously three dimensional and realistic and makes things pop. So a lot of what I see tends to be tonal anyway, even if it's colour, I'm still thinking in terms of tone. 
in terms of how dark the blue is, how light the blue is, how much water you put on with it, how thick it comes out of the palette. So a lot of what I do is very tonal. And is that a sequential thing? In other words, like if say you were going to do something that wasn't just black and white, but it was going to be in color, would you begin by thinking in terms of tone? Yeah, I think I would. Yeah, I mean the tonal. I think because a lot of a lot of my urban sketches started off very much as just black and white drawings. I mean, this is going back years and years and years. And so I think I've always had a very strong tonal element to what I do, even though the colour has become very kind of vibrant and such a, a, dana, a, dana, a dynamic part of what I do. The, the, the tonal um, essence of it is still really important. And it's just something that I'm always kind of working on. And will you literally do tone first and then bring in color? Or is it that you're thinking in, in terms of the um, tone in the you know, color? It very much varies. I mean, sometimes I will actually just put tone on and work color on top. But the trouble is sometimes it can get a little bit muddy then. So often what I'll do is I'll put the color on and then I'll put the tone on top of the color to kind of calm it down. Mm. This is a great image. I'm just loving this image to draw from. Yeah, it is. And it has a it has a sort of muted quality to it too. It's like it's taken on sort of probably a winterish day by the looks of things. Um, mm. you know, it's also making me homesick because if you oh. continue down this street, um that's where I, my house is. So this is yeah. This yeah, it was like right yeah, right at the vanishing point of this picture is my house, which I'm, wow. I'm 3,000 miles away from. So, uh, but you know, New York is opening up again, so it's possible that I'm we will get to go home soon. But you know, well, I'm meant to be I'm meant to be going there in October. I know. Well, I think you'll be able to. I, mean, I think so. I think here's the thing that's that's concerned us the most is traveling on a plane or as a so an epide, epidemiologist referred to it as a tube full of germs so <laughs> you know that's that's the thing that's like holding us up we've seriously been considering like should we drive home you know it's a long it's a long drive and we'd have to stop at a lot of motels so how, long, that long. How, long it, how long would it take you to, to drive from well Phoenix i've done it and... twice i've done it twice so we um when we lived in los angeles a few years ago when we went back to New York, we drove and it took, we spent 10 days doing it. But my son, wow. when he moves to Los Angeles after he graduated from college, we did it again and he drove, we did it in five or six days. But you could do it. I mean, in fact, somebody broke the record during the uh, shutdown. Some, some guys have been doing it because all the, the roads have been empty and uh, the record was 25 hours. Wow. Yeah. The distances in America are just insane. <laughs> I mean, if you drove for 25 hours from where we are, you get to the other side of Europe easily. I know, I know. Can I just show you mine now? Yeah, so please do. Yeah. Let me make a big... I've added a bit of lighter tone and a bit of darker tone just to kind of start pinging all the values in. Mm. So in some ways, that's the tonal structure of the picture. And then what I'm going to do now is start working in a lot more detail. It's so interesting to see, to see the difference between right. the way you're looking at it and the way I'm looking at it. But isn't that the most wonderful thing about art? How no, we, true. we all have different visions. We all see things in different kind of ways. And I just, I just love that. So this weekend we did this uh, workshop with friends, uh, Van Stone. We, it was, it was actually, we were looking for a cheap model. So we had a picture of me. And uh, so then we ended up with something like a hundred drawings from this same photo. And it was just fascinating to see the variety. And in fact, that's something that we're going to be doing with your workshop as well as we're going to be, um, people will have the chance to do this feedback session. And in the feedback oh, session, right. they'll be able to send in their version of um, what you're doing and we'll be uh, getting to see all the different looks that all these different artists are going to make. It's going to be just amazing. That would be so cool. It'll be really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, we started doing this feedback for the first time this um, during this workshop and it was really interesting because basically what happens is we do the workshop and then people send in a photo of what they've done and say well this is what I'd like to know about you know here's here's a place I had a, I had a problem and um, so we end up having this discussion 
which I'm, which we're going to do with yours as well, where, where we really get into the nitty gritty of all the different, not, I, I, would, I was going to say mistakes, but I don't think they are mistakes. I think just all the different choices that people are making and, uh, yeah. you know, what they're getting out of it, which is, which is fascinating. You must have that that's, when you do live work, workshops. Where you oh, get that's to. what I love. I, I mean, I just love it so much when we're all sitting in front of the same lo location mm -hmm. and we're all looking at the same building or the same square or the same statue and everybody just sees different things. And it's not it's not a stylistic thing. It's just to do with vision and it's what you edit as you as you look at something and how you edit things out. And it's all based on your your memory, your experience, your history, your feelings of, of the place. And, and I just think it's fascinating because you're saying so much about yourself. And sometimes in a very kind of in, indirect way, you know, you don't even realise. Um, and I just find it absolutely fascinating how, you know, 15 artists can all be in front of the same subject and they can all see different things. And yeah, it's that's... not just based on your style or, you know, your ability. It's, it's just based on what you think you want to put into that picture. You know, what you feel is important, what you feel is is significant. And I just find that incredible. That's one of the things I've and enjoyed you... about urban sketching is um, is you go and you sit with a bunch of other people on the sidewalk and uh, you're all looking at the same scene from slightly different angles because you're spread yeah. across the pavement. But then, then you get together afterwards and you compare your work. And that is just amazing. And in fact, last summer, we went to the um, Urban Sketchers Symposium in, in um, Amsterdam. It seems like a gazillion years ago, but, but there was an opportunity to be literally on the edge of the canal with you know, 500 people all drawing the same scene. It was incredible, really cool. It was very hot. It was very, very, very hot. It was so hot. It was t it was uh, hottest. I mean, it was it's, it was a normal day in Phoenix, but it was ridiculously hot for Amsterdam. And then there was a there was a right. a tornado that came through the next day. It was nuts. It was nuts. But that, it just seems so long ago. It's like yeah. well, I was I was one of the instructors there last year, and I I I'm a bit of a nightmare for the organisers because I always run my workshops in in three different locations all the time. Mm. I always a different location for each one because it makes it interesting for me. I don't want to draw the same thing, you know, three times. So the logistics can be a bit of a nightmare, but because it was so hot in Amsterdam, everyone was very careful to try and find shade. And it, it's tricky finding shade for each of your three workshops because you're kind of watching the sun all the time. So you start off at, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning and it's, it's fine. And then within like an hour, the sun's crept around the corner and everyone's just starting to melt yeah it's true it's a it's a rugged adventure being a, being a, a committed urban sketcher um, oh, but I, I love that. that's what i love about it so much you know, the world is your studio and you just meet danny so many really interesting people and people I mean, who love drawing yeah especially where i live in liverpool <laughs> Are there a lot yes. of people who are uh, a lot of urban sketches in Liverpool? There is. Yeah, we've got we've got a big we've got a big group. We've got two groups where I live because I, I live on the Wirral, which is the peninsula of land across the River Mersey from Liverpool. And we've got our own Wirral group. And then there's also the, the Liverpool group as well. And the Liverpool group is really big. I guess there's about six, seven hundred members. And we often get a lot of people turning up each each. Well, we used to get a lot of people turning up each month before the world closed down. And is there a lot of great architecture? There is. In Liverpool, Liverpool's amazing, yeah. The architecture's fabulous. Um, but I love the architecture in America. I mean, I was in New Orleans in November, and I just had a whale of a time just yeah. drawing the, the typical kind of what I'd say Americana, the things that you see in America that you don't see anywhere else, like the signage and, and the kind of the stop sign and the hand sign. You get this hand sign, the hand sign that says, don't move, don't walk. We don't get anything like that in the UK. It's a little thing. And the, and the fire hydrants are just amazing. And in, in New Orleans, you've got all the typical kind of like, you know, colonial, colonial is, it, is that right? Colonial French architecture that you see which is just incredible 
Yeah, it's not really called colonial. Colonial is more sort of. I guess I guess it was sort of a colony, New Orleans. I don't know, um, but, but but we filmed a class there with uh, Jason Doss, who used to be the president of um, or the Urban Sketcher organization, and he we we went there and filmed with him drawing all over New Orleans, and it was really fun. He and I actually did a drawing together where we both worked on the same drawing at the same time. Um, so we sat next to each other and we just kind of reached over each other and worked on this drawing. It was a really cool exercise. I don't know if you've ever done that, but, uh-huh. but you basically, um, you each, your styles kind of blend in with each other because, yeah. uh, you know. Yeah. We used to kind of do that thing at college. When I was at art college in London, we had to do that kind of thing. And we all ended up fighting and killing each other. <laughs> Give me that part. I want to do that. Don't go over my, hey, I spent yeah. 10 minutes drawing that. Now you're repainting it. Oh, my God. Well, yeah. All the egos, all the egos come out. Yeah. <laughs> well, fortunately, we, uh, go down to, we go down to the pub afterwards and carry on the conversation. <laughs> yeah, Jason and I were uh, good collaborators, I'm glad to say. So we didn't. Uh, but but Kosha and I have done that a few times, too. And then, then you look at the drawing, you go, kind of looks like I did it, but sort of doesn't. Yeah. And, you know, it's just like this weird <laughs> time. When, when you do that kind of exercise, you, I think you learn a lot about yourself, don't you? You learn. You, know, what, you learn about about how you see things and what you see compared to how other people see things. It's true because you might notice something and you're working on it and then the other person comes along and inserts a couple of things that you completely didn't see or you have a certain priority and they have a different one and it comes out quite differently. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think those sort of collaborative things are, gr- are great to learn as well, you know, from your own your own point of view, how you learn about, yeah, just I suppose what, what you think is important in a scene. I mean, I, I find sometimes I can be drawing something on location and suddenly I realize there's like a massive big thing in front of me and it could be like a sign or it could be a building and I just didn't even see it. And I've noticed now in this particular picture, you've got that amazing clock and then just to the left of the clock, you've got a sign. I know. It's a poster. I, just, I, I really just noticed it the first I time. just added that too. And also actually halfway up, there's a, um, a big flower planter. I don't know if you noticed that. It looks like a ball. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. like it's a, actually an enormous sort of piece that's hanging there. And you have to decide whether you want to include that. You may not want to include that. I don't know. Are you putting people in? Because I've left the people out. I'm, I'm not putting people, and I've not even put the cars in either. But I probably should have done. I had to put some cars in just because it's the foreground, and I wasn't quite sure what to do with that area. So. I tend to not put cars in unless they're stationary. Because I think if, if they're in the middle of the road, it's it's obvious that you you know you wouldn't draw them normally in, in like on location because they're just like whizzing past at thirty miles an hour. That's true, but they do help to tell you that it's a city and that it's alive. You know, in fact, if you went to the street corner in New York right a, a week or two ago, it would have been completely empty. So it's just, this building, the Flatiron Building, is an incredible piece of architecture. It's um, considered really the first. Uh, major skyscraper in New York, um, well, that and the Woolworth building, but it's a beautiful building. And, it's great. Uh, yeah. And why is it on such a, an angle? Why is it? It's it because like this is, well, because this is the intersection of Fifth Avenue and Broadway. So Broadway, oh, okay. Broadway runs diagonally across Manhattan, whereas the Fifth right. the Avenues run up and down. So you get these weird intersections. Uh, this is a 23rd oh, okay. Street, the same with 34th Street, which is where you have Herald Square. And then, of course, Times Square is also the intersection of 7th Avenue and Broadway. So it's just it causes it breaks the grid and you end up with these yeah, different shapes. I you know, so and that's New York. Phoenix, we don't have anything like this. Phoenix, everything is very low. Everything is like. Are you missing? Are you missing New York then? Have you ter- missed it? Terribly, terribly. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I. I I miss New York in general and I miss New York the way it was, you know, so it's weird to think about because, you know, I, I first, I mean, I, I've lived in New York since I was 12 and uh, well, I was also there in the, after I graduated from college in the early 80s and at that point New York was really different than it is now. Um, it was, you know, it was the end of the financial crisis there, there was terrible crime, there was, the subways were a mess. Um, and now it feels like it might be going back to that. Uh, might have really? The return of the old New York. Yeah, and graffiti everywhere, and 
you know, you couldn't go to Central Park. It wasn't safe. I don't know. We'll see if if that happens. But there's definitely going to be a lot of changes. And, you know, the big question is what happens with the subway? Because the subway is so essential to everything. But if people don't feel safe going on the subway because of, of the virus, it's it means that people aren't going to be able to work. It means that, you know, it's just everything is going to be very different. Well, these these changes that you just you're talking about at the moment are these to do with the coronavirus absolutely. pandemic or yeah absolutely that... no, people don't feel safe going on a crowded subway train because of the uh, virus. Okay. so yeah it's definitely that i mean other than that new york has been doing you know I mean, new york has gotten so expensive and almost impossible for young, young people to live in um it's become definitely a city of the rich but now who knows what will happen we'll see we'll see so I'm kind of going to stop because I'm getting to that point where I know that I'll start overworking things if I'm not careful. So um, let's let's share our work and uh, go back to looking. Let's share where we are. So this is this is kind of where I got to. Wow, that is that's that's so different. It's so different from mine. Yeah, it's brilliant. Love the tone in that. Yeah, Super. I was gonna, I was going to I was going to go over Super. with um, with with fine liners. But I kind of like the sort of misty watercolor memories, to quote Barbara Streisand, um, that, it, that it has. It has. It feels like a memory, um, as opposed to, as opposed to. Uh, I could. Sharp, I could sing that detail. song. I could sing that song. M- must you? Misty watercolored memories. I love it. I love that song. It's so cool. The way we were. It's true. So good. Ah. Hey, there's Rick Denbrober from Chilliwack, British Columbia. Nice to see you, Rick. Okay. Um, so, oh, there we go. There. Beautiful. Look at how different that is. So you really, I focus so much on shadows. And is this? Do you feel like you're? What? At what point in the in this drawing are you? Are you ten percent of the way? A hundred percent of the way? Where are you? Well, it depends. I mean, if, if I was to do this as a proper urban sketch, I wouldn't have done this amount of tone. I would have mm-hmm. just done a line drawing and then put the colour on and then put the tone on top. Um, but the, I've, I've kind of treated this as a kind of quick sketch, really. So in some ways, this is probably finished, because I think if I kind of went over it again, it would lose that energy, lose that dynamism. And I like the freshness of it at the moment. So I'll probably just tidy it up a little bit. I won't do a huge amount more because I just kind of like how the lines are going off for a walk, you know, and it's very much, I've, I've, no, I've never been to New York, so I'm kind of imagining, you know, this is this is what you're going to see. You're going to see this coming right the way down yeah. and going across and going back up again. You know, that kind of movement, that energy going up and down, that kind of linear thing that you see all the time. So I was, I suppose- Wait, I hold up, hold to... up again, because I wanted to make a couple comments on that that I think are interesting. Because <laughs> um, I think you, uh, I mean, first of all, there's tremendous d- dimension um, between the foreground and the background. I mean, there's real sense of depth. I also love that the street is all active. Like, even though it's blurred, you get the sense of movement and energy and so forth. And then um, I also love the attention that you pay to the clock face. And it kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 a fun, it's a fun thing to draw. I didn't even, I didn't even deal with it at all. It's really cool that you mention that, Danny, because going back to the conversation we had before about the difference between a photograph and reality, if I was sitting on location drawing that, that 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 clock face I would be drawn towards, I know I'd be really looking at that. And I'd probably get off my bum, get off my seat and walk into the scene and really kind of investigate what it looked like and noticed all the patterns and, and you know, all the kind of elaborate kind of fancy stuff going around the outside. So that's kind of like channeling almost what you know you would do if you were actually drawing in reality and it's the same i suppose with the people in the cars i've not put them in because i know i wouldn't really see them because they just be very transient you know whizzing by all the time so i suppose you're kind of simulating even though it's a photograph you're simulating the effect of what it might be if you were experiencing it in in real life i no, suppose it's true i mean yeah. i think i mean i have i have sat here and i have drawn down here um i i hadn't realized that you'd never been to new york before but that's going to be very exciting for you but but this clock is big and it kind of sits over your head so you, chances are you probably you have to be pretty far back to see it at all yeah um i think your eye would be on 
on the Flatiron building. I think that's where really you would look. But again, as we said, this photograph, it tends to make everything of equal value. So the people walking yeah. in the foregrounds, the, the sides of the buildings, you know, you have to, as an artist, I think, look at the photograph and say, I'm going to make my decisions in between all of these things. I'm going to choose what is important. And, um, yeah. you know, another thing that I would normally do and didn't really think about that much today is drawing the negative space of the sky because the negative space of the sky in this photograph is really obvious. I mean, it's, it's basically flat white. Um, and so that would be a good guide if you're, if you're kind of worried about your location, you know, um, locating the different elements, that would be a great way of doing it. Cause I'm looking at it now and I'm realizing I got the angle of the roof of the flat iron building completely wrong. Um, and I made it much less dramatic than it really is. So looking at looking back at that negative space can really help you to to check your relationships, um, as it were, because I, I'm realizing like the flat iron building is is actually much bigger than I made it. So I might even go back in and fix it. But you know, I'm seeing like this this thing would normally right. be be much yeah. taller. It would be love, yeah. Love, I love the shape of yours though. I love it. It's got a real cuteness about it. it is it's got a real. <laughs> It it's looks less like the prow beautiful. of a ship than it does in the photo. Yeah, but yeah, um, so, yeah. Danny, what what did you use for yours? Was that just ink, ink and brush? It was just ink and brush. Yeah. So I have a wow. I have, a, I have a, a thing and I have a saucer, and I just sort of squeeze it and just create. And I built up tones over the time. I started kind of very diluted and I just kept layering and layering and layering. So, but which yeah. is you know, and I think. Just to go back to the workshop, because I think that that's so much of what you talk about um, in, yeah. in when you teach workshops is this business of continually getting deeper and deeper into it, getting deeper with your layers, with your tones. And that's that's, a, I think, an essential thing is you don't make decisions about your tonal range. Really, at the beginning, you start to become aware of them as you go. Right. Yeah. Just and I, and I think also your you, you decision making is, ba is based upon the materials that you've got in front of you. So, for example, when I start off sketching my house using the brush pen, I, I use the, the fine liner part of the brush pen. Mm. All I'm thinking is, is big shapes. But more importantly, more important than the big shapes is how those big shapes fit into the outside space of the page. So it's about location. It's location, location, location. It's getting it on. And that's that's the only thing I'm tuned into. I'm not even thinking that it's a clock or it's a flat iron building or it's a pedestrian crossing. I'm just thinking of shapes and the size of them. So my, my thinking is all very much about what I'm doing and the materials I'm using. And then the next layer, you go and get a lot deeper and you're looking at things and you're picking up things, but you're working within those first shapes. And then you put the colour on. So you're thinking very much about the emotional side, if you're using colour or if you're using tone, are you thinking about the three dimensional aspect of it? So your thinking is very much determined by the part of the process that you're doing and also the materials that you've got in your hand. And then eventually you get right down to the fine detail when you start, you know, getting off your backside and you walk into the scene and you, and you look at things and, you know, really notice what's going on. And it's it's just a, a layering process that just works really well, really right. well for me. It's I mean, good fun. It's great. So when, when you taught for us in watercolor rules, which if you, yeah. you guys haven't taken this class, it's phenomenal. But one, we spent a week of the six weeks with Ian. And when you did your demonstration there, you spent, I think, three or four hours probably doing that drawing, right? Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah, it, it was, three hour drawing. Yeah, yeah three hour yeah. drawing. And you there, of course, you brought in color, you brought in even more media. And you really yeah. layered it and got deeper and deeper and deeper. It was fascinating yeah. to watch. I mean, there was just so many lessons to be learned in the process of, of mm. watching somebody do a drawing like that and uh mm. you know i think this workshop that you're going to be doing uh in a couple of weeks is i think another opportunity that people will have to i mean what you just did in 20 minutes you're going to do in a couple of hours in this workshop and yeah. you're really going to teach us in great detail and you're going to be continuing to to um bring out so many different elements in it i mean i think this workshop I can't wait for it. It's going to be so amazing. And I'm also yeah. really looking forward to, to seeing what people make in it because um, the, the one, the thing that we have now started doing in our workshops, if you took an early workshop, you may not have experienced this, but we stop the workshop 
every 15, 20 minutes, and we just talk about what's happened so far. And if you are drawing along with Ian, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions or to catch up or whatever it is you want. You'll have you'll have these little mini breaks, um, and then you'll also have time throughout to ask questions. But then you'll also have this this additional experience of sending in your drawing for me and Ian to look at and to say, uh, okay, what was what was the uh, what were the things that that struck you? What were the obstacles you felt? you were struggling with um, and Ian's going to give you one-on-one -on -one advice about that. That's going to be really fun to do too. Do yeah. you like, do you like teaching? Yeah. I, I love, well, I love teaching. Well, my, my whole, my whole career has been teaching, you know, I've, I've taught all my life. That's my, that's my background. Even though I started out as an artist, I went into teaching um, at quite a young age and I, I was a primary school teacher. So I taught oh, really? young children. Yeah. Not an art teacher, but a primary school teacher. So I had a class of kids that stayed with me all the time. So I, I, I love I love teaching. But I think when you do workshops and when we do the workshop together, the um, the paint town grey, I think it's really important that when I'm commenting or appraising people's work, you judge them by the criteria by which you put them forward the thing that they're doing. So, you know, it's going to be based upon the, 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 the critique will be based upon what it is what the objectives are that we're exactly. trying to put across right you know so it, it would be based on things like the three-dimensional aspect using a variety of tone you know or it's that it's that they're the key things really making right. making the thing jump out because you've got a variety of tone um and that's kind of embedded in a lot of the three-dimensional drawing that i i try and do you know otherwise it just becomes very flat and people can't connect with it they can't link themselves into it they can't imagine themselves walking stepping into it right, right. Scene. yeah so it's all about stepping in so the one of albella bello it's imagining yourself walking into that scene and noticing all the stuff and, and just connecting with it relating with it really so so yeah so i i love i love teaching I, i'm but you've got to be very clear on what it is you you're teaching you right. know you can't you can't just say that's great and that's yeah, and I think like, one of the things that we do when we do when we feedback when we do feedback sessions, what we do is we say, don't just send us your picture and say what do you think, but say specifically, I'm, I'm I want help on this particular thing. And what happens yeah. is, what's interesting in these feedback sessions is you might go there to get feedback on your particular piece, but when you're watching feedback on lots and lots of people's pieces, you'll say, oh that's actually a problem I didn't even really realize I had, or that's an interesting tip. So, so by having these kind of layers of comments, you get a really, really well-rounded thing. I mean, I think people who went to the last one just got so much more even than they'd gotten out of the original workshop because of this feedback thing. It's, it's really fun and I'm, I can't wait to do it. Yeah. Let's hold up our drawings one more time and then, uh, oops, oops. And isn't it great that they're so different as well? So, I just, I love that. I think it's just different. great. Completely different. And we want to see what you did. So if you if you want to post it in the schoolyard or if you want to post it on social media, you can use this hashtag daily drawing habit. If you do it mm. in the schoolyard, there's going to be that you can put it with just uh, draw with me, which is what this thing is called that we're doing today. Um, and if you want to join Ian's workshop, here's the, address for that sketchbookschool.com slash workshops and um, sign up because we only have a couple more weeks to do it and then we're going to have a really fun Saturday and an even and another and a really fun Sunday when we go through all the work that you've done so hey Ian thank you so much thanks so much for joining thanks Danny Jen, for joining thank me with this both. and yeah you're welcome yeah no it's been really thanks. nice and I can't wait right. to draw yeah. with you again in a couple of weeks yeah I just I want I want to go to New York now <laughs> I can't, I can't wait here. till October. Same here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really well. Um, Carol suggested I take the train. Yeah, but the train is another tube full of germs. So uh, I don't know about that. I'm trying to avoid tubes. The car, our car at least is full of our own germs. So that might be the solution. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I don't have to get back there. It's, I'm looking forward to 110 degrees here in Phoenix. And uh, missing the sweaty, sweaty summer in New York, but 
Anyway. You're lucky. It's been raining here today. We had rain. I was meant to go out drawing up with one of my friends and it was pouring down this morning. Yeah. Well, here you can't go outside and draw after eight o'clock in the morning. Wow. I mean, I get oh up God. at five and I go for an, an hour long walk and then wow. I do a little bit of drawing then and then I can do a bit of drawing again after seven in the evening. But it gets progressively hotter until six. So you can't you just can't go outside unless you sit in a car. And even that's really hard. What, so. Andy, what's what's Phoenix like as a place to go and draw? Is it interesting? Are there lots of nice, interesting buildings? I haven't honestly seen much of it. I've been here for three months, basically locked down. <laughs> So I don't know. I'm looking forward to finding out. <laughs> but yeah, everything is very flat, though, because um, they don't want to make, you know, buildings that have to be air conditioned that are multi. So everybody's house is flat. So, all right. Well, okay. thank you so much, Ian. Maybe you'll post your drawing in the schoolyard as well, so we can all see yeah. the, the finished drawing. And I will too. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you again next time. Okay. Bye bye.